about 1,500 scientists are working on this. The picture behind me here shows a computer simulation of the gravitational waves emitted when two small black holes merge to form one large black hole. And by the end of this decade, we expect to directly observe this kind of process using gravitational waves. So in my talk, I'm first going to describe the fundamental physics, what are gravitational waves. I'll show you how the modern detectors work. I'll tell you something about the important sources of gravitational waves, what science we can do. I'll tell you about the next generation of detectors, perhaps I should say the current generation of detectors, because they just started operating uh, last month. Um, I'll talk a bit about the sources that we might also see in electromagnetic radiation, and if there's some time, I'll talk about the longer term future. I know this seems like a very formal setting, but if you want to ask something, I'd be delighted. So just put up your hand or shout if something I say isn't clear. So my first topic is gravitational waves. What are they? How are they produced? So the ideas behind gravitational waves had their origins in Einstein's work in 1905. As you know, Einstein's special theory of relativity, which he published in 1905, has as one of its fundamental concepts that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And this discovery in 1905 created a problem. And the problem had to do with Isaac Newton's universal law of gravitation. Because in Newton's law of gravitation, gravity is instantaneous. There's no delay for propagation. So let me illustrate this incompatibility. Um, the Earth orbits the Sun in a circle. It's about 150 million kilometers in radius. And it takes light about 1,000 seconds to cross this entire circle. So um, now you know, I think most people here have a scientific background. You know that if something moves in a circle, that means the acceleration is towards the center of the circle. And so here, the center of the circle is the sun. Well, where is the sun? If you look in the sky, you can see the sun. But if you think about it, you're not seeing the sun where it is right now. You're seeing the sun where it was eight minutes, eight minutes ago. And so, suppose we measure the acceleration of the Earth as it goes in this circle. Would that vector point towards where we see the sun right now? In Newton's theory, it wouldn't. It would point to where we'll see the sun eight minutes from now. And so, Newton's theory is not consistent with Einstein's special relativity. And it took Einstein about 10 years to sort this out. And so the modern description of gravity, Einstein's general theory of relativity, um, was discovered or invented um, in 1915. It resolves this incompatibility. So in general relativity, mass and energy curve the geometry of space-time, as shown here. And particles, like light, travel along the shortest path in this geometry. So for example, a star might be here, Sorry, a star might be here, pardon me, but gravity curves the ray, the, the path that the ray follows, so somebody looking actually sees the star somewhere else. And if you have rapidly moving masses, then the gravitational effects of these travel away at the speed of light, and you get waves in the geometry which move away from the source at the speed of light. So these are called gravitational waves. Now, gravitational waves carry energy, um, but they're very weak. And a formula for the luminosity of gravitational waves has a very tiny factor in front. It's the square of the third time of the quadrupole moment with this tiny factor of Newton's gravitational constant divided by the fifth power of the speed of light. And that number is so tiny that Einstein himself thought that these waves couldn't be detected. So 
Gravitational waves were first described in this 1916 article by Einstein, but he got some of the details wrong, and it took several more publications before he actually got those details right. And I've just quoted here, I've translated from German, this first statement in the literature about gravitational waves. But until 1974, gravitational waves were just a theoretical prediction from the Einstein field of vision. Then, in 1974, a pulsar was discovered called um, V 1913 plus 16. This is loosely shown in this diagram. This pulsar is a very compact um, neutron star, which is, pardon me, it's one of these two, which is orbiting a companion star, which is probably also a neutron star. These two stars orbit once every seven and three quarter hours. The orbit is eccentric, as you see here. And, and here's the fantastic thing. Paulson Taylor, observing this system, discovered that each orbit, the two stars come closer together, three and a half millimeters. So the orbit of this system is a few million kilometers across. It's about four times the size of our sun. Yet you can measure it, the orbit so precisely because one of these systems is a very precise clock. And this falling together is proof that Einstein was right. Because in Newton's theory of gravity, two stars that are orbiting just continue the same orbit forever. But in Einstein's theory, when the stars orbit, they emit some gravitational waves. Now in this case, the frequency of the gravitational waves is twice the orbital frequency. So it's tens of microhertz. But the system loses energy, and the stars gradually fall together. So we know that gravitational waves exist because it's seen in the system. Now, think about this. After the system has done three orbits, it takes about 24 hours in one day, the two stars have come together about 10, 10 millimeters, one centimeter. And so after a year, the two stars have lost enough energy to become three meters together. After a thousand years, three kilometers. And after about 300 million years, these two stars will actually merge together and they'll form a black hole. And this is the kind of thing that we'd like to see with our gravitational wave detectors. A system like this pulse Taylor binary pulsar, but um, at the end of its life. In, in 1993, Hulse um, and Taylor received uh, a Nobel Prize for their discovery. Um, there's a plot here which simply shows that um, the rate at which the um, orbit is advancing in the system agrees exactly with general relativity. In fact, about 10 years ago, a similar system consisting of two neutron stars was now called a double pulsar. Both neutron stars can be seen pulsing. And so, in fact, that gives much better um, constraints on Einstein's theory, some of our best tests of general relativity. Okay, so we know gravitational waves exist because their effects are seen in the system. Now, how do we detect them? So let me start by showing you some pictures of the current generation of gravitational wave detectors. This is one of the laser interferometer gravitational observatory detectors in the United States. The first, these letters form the acronym LIGO, L-I-G-O. This one is um, located northwest of the United States, um, near the uh, grounds of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Uh, this is what it looks like from an airplane. Um, there's a central building here, and then these arms are both four kilometers long. What you actually see here is a concrete shell. And inside that shell is a long vacuum tube. This is the second uh, LIGO detector. This is in the state of Louisiana. It's about 3,000 kilometers from the other detector. So it can take light 10 milliseconds to travel from one instrument to the other. This is a detector in Europe, uh, the Virgo detector in Kashina. 
Uh, this is um, from the French-Italian collaboration. It's also taken on members from some other European countries in recent years. And this is the geo detector. This is a German-British project. It's operated by my institute. Uh, this is smaller than the other instruments. The arms are about 600 meters long. This means it's less sensitive. Uh, but it's been a very important place for developing technology. And the technology in the larger detectors was in large part developed and tested here in GEO. This is a Japanese detector that's now under construction called Kagra. This is being built in tunnels under a mountain, which reduces the shaking of the ground. And I'll describe later why that's important. It's on the same site as the Kamio Kande neutrino detector. This was funded in 2010, and construction began in 2012. So how do these detectors work? To explain, let me show you first how gravitational waves affect things with a thought experiment. So you have to imagine that we're in space. We're just floating far away from the sun, from planets, from anything in space. Hopefully wearing a space suit so we have something to breathe. And we take some marbles and we just lay them in a circle, very delicately. So they're just floating there next to us. Now imagine that a gravitational wave comes, for example, from a supernova that's far behind the blackboard. What will happen is these marbles will begin to oscillate in this pattern. It's a quadrupole pattern. The thing is that what I've drawn here on the screen is greatly exaggerated. And so, roughly speaking, if you were very close to two black holes or two neutron stars that were colliding together, this is what you'd see. But if you were far away, the effect is reduced by the ratio of the size of that object, a few kilometers, divided by the distance to us. And so, that's 21 orders of magnitude for systems that are at megaparsec distances. So you don't see such a big oscillation in our experiments. So gravitational wave detectors look for this motion using technology that wasn't available for Einstein. Ultra-stable lasers, electronic control systems. The way the instrument works is the marbles are replaced by these four masses, these are mirrors, and they hang from wires, which means that they're free to move along these axes. A laser illuminates these mirrors in an interferometer. By the way, for those of you who are physics students, this should look like something that you study. Somebody tell me? Named after the American physicist Michelson. So what happens is, the light forms interference fringes at this photodetector. And if a gravitational wave comes from directly above, it changes the distance between these pairs of mirrors. It first decreases the distance here and increases the distance there, and then half a cycle later, the other way around. So the interference fringes at the photodetector can move a little bit. And that motion is an observable signal. This is what the instruments um, actually look like. Um, you don't see the mirrors and the lasers because everything is in vacuum systems. So there's big vacuum tanks. And these are tall because the suspension elements are actually hanging inside here. Uh, this is an optical bench with a laser. Uh, this is one of the optics. Uh, I like fine mechanics, Swiss watches. Diamond jewelry. And, and, and these things are like jewels. The surface of these mirrors is precise to nanometers. So that means that's roughly you know, the height of a handful of atoms. So the average position of the surface of the mirror is incredibly precise. I think these things are like jewelry too, partly because of the price. Uh, these are almost unique uh, pieces of optics. And this is a picture of people working inside one of those uh, vacuum chambers. See, there's 
there's, they're, they're wearing bunny suits so they don't contaminate it, and there's um, a shield hanging around her. There's filtered air being put into there to keep things clean. Okay, so the effect of gravitational waves is very hard to observe because it's so small. So in the experiment, the thought experiment with the marbles, um, you saw these big deformations. And now you're supposed to imagine that the same thing is happening to our instrument. So here's the two arms of the interferometer with the laser. And here's the photo detector with the fringes. And as the gravitational wave goes by, 